it's really nice to be back, everybody. And I, I want to say that um, I believe every community has a, a consciousness about them, a, a fabric of uh, personality and um, expression and depth. And your community has a really beautiful way of making somebody like me feel cared for. There's just a way in which there's a warmth in the communication and an open invitation. And I just think you should know that. So I appreciate everything that you have offered me in the way of uh, being able to, to share time with you this year. So it's good to be back. I asked uh, quite a while ago for some guidance with regards to how to do the work that I do. And the work that I'm referring to is the work with my foundation, particularly in territories, well, they're all in territories that are very vulnerable, uh, poverty-ridden, uh, high illiteracy rate, lots of disease and filth, and all of the things that one uh, can become very overwhelmed by. So just as one need is fulfilled, there is a laundry list of other needs that are fulfilled. And so it's more than stamina that's needed. It's even more, I think, than financial that's needed. It's, it's some inner knowing that the tenets of which our new thought philosophies are built on are truth. And that is that the only reality is God. And it's been a really uh, incredible opportunity for me to stare in the face of certain things and not be able to see that. And in that moment, invoke some kind of reconciliation. What is it that I need to know so that that tenant of truth, that idea that we live in a universe of perfect patterning. How do I bring integrity to that? How do I teach that? How does it not become just something that is spoken out of convenience, but something that ir is irrevocable regardless of appearances? So that was kind of a big request, a big request to the energies of the universe. How, how can I do this more effectively? And because I find that as I have aged over the years, and I've been doing this now for almost 20 years, that it hasn't become easier. It's actually become harder. And with all of the wonderful breakthroughs and all of the uh, beautiful, joyful moments of victories that we have had bringing global education and solution to these vulnerable territories, it's still very difficult to... to um, try to, as they say, feed the hungry ghost, which means that you keep feeding something that will never be full. There's no finish line to it. And I wanted something more than stamina. I wanted something more than more human help. I wanted a, a knowing inside of me. And that in and of itself was and has been an incredible journey. And I'm gonna share something with you that I don't know if I will give it the potency that it needs to with words, but it was the answer to that question. And it was this, that in this plane of form, so by plane of form, I'm talking about what you and I are experiencing, this dimension that we call life, this that defines this skin suit and this name and this history. In this plane of form, there will always be yin yang. By yin yang, we're talking about that which is the dark and that which is the light. When we have a taste of the light, we can be led into thinking that, well, now what we will do is we will eradicate the dark. And our definition of eradicating the dark sometimes is to try and fix all of that and make it disappear on the plane of form. But my request and the clarity that came from my request 
is that the plane of form will always hold the dark and the light. It's kind of like woven into the curriculum, if you will. And so the goal isn't to eradicate the dark. The goal is once you have some footing in the light to then do whatever is possible to keep shining that light, to serving that light, not to weary yourself in defeating the darkness, but by coming someone whose aim and resource is to strengthen their relationship with the light, even in the seeming darkness. I don't know if that makes sense or not, or if it's as revolutionary in saying it as it felt to me, but there was something really profound about stop trying to eradicate the dark because yin yang is a part is a part of the fabric of the human experience. So our role then in awakening is to participate as much as possible in the sight of the light, whether that means feeding someone, helping someone, loving someone, being able to look beyond appearances and do your own spiritual practice. All of that carries equal weight and that which is the advocate for the light. So I remembered that I, I embarked on India to India for the all of November. And I went there mostly because we were launching a program. It's called a WASH program. And if you are involved in public health in any way, WASH is an acronym for water accessibility, sanitation, and hygiene. It is labeled as the world's greatest need. And WASH programs and um, sanitation hygiene programs are not just confined to the slums of India. It's a worldwide issue. And you can imagine with the experience we've all shared with COVID that in these extreme vulnerable territories, it's even more mission critical to be able to bring education to them. So I've been working with uh, Emory University here in Atlanta with their master's degree of public health students. And we developed a WASH program, which was culturally nuanced for the people of India, the women of India, the children of India, particularly in the rural territories and the slums. By culturally nuanced, it's not trying to westernize or bulldoze what we think but taking their culture in and teaching it in a way that was palatable and acceptable to them. And we were really proud of what it was that we came up with. And so that was the bulk of the visit was to go to my school in Lakhanpur, India, which is a slum in the state of Bihar, and to launch this program. And, and so it was far better than we could have ever expected. Uh, one of my students here at Emory, she's from India, and once she graduated, she was unable to get work here in the States, which is what she wanted, and no employer would sign off on her foreign applications to keep her here, so she had to go back to India, and we all saw the meticulousness and the reason why, because the brilliance of her ability to teach this program, we, we wouldn't have been able to do it without her. And she's never taught before. And I said, well, you're, you're pulling one over on me because the way in which you adapted to the older students, to the younger students, and to the village mothers was a stroke of genius. And so we were all very, very proud of the work that we had put in and to see that come to fruition. And so I was with my partner. My partner works for the CDC and has a master's degree in public health and has, uh, he does a really in unenviable job of trying to allocate money and get money from Congress for diseases around the world. And I wanted him to see it. I want everyone to see it because it's one thing to show a picture of it. It's one thing to show videos of it on social media, but to actually be there 
boots to the ground to experience any of this educational work that we do takes on a whole different level of experience. And, and when it was all over and we were packing to go to a different territory in India, he said to me, he goes, wow, you established an economy. You established an economy that didn't exist. And I said, what? And he said, you gave this Indian man a job. Nandu, who's my, like my Indian son, my administrator, I had put him on a pilot program and he did a brilliant job. And since 2016, he's been my chief administrator. He said, when you gave him a job, not only did that job then sort of salvage his family, but then it salvaged all of the people that his family was able to take in because of the income that he had. You gave teachers jobs. You have um, up-leveled the quality of life and restored dignity to people in a way that if that one decision hadn't happened, would not exist. And I want to clarify, it's like, I didn't do it. It was a mutual decision by my foundation and all of us who worked tirelessly to make this happen. But the phrase that he said that just really cracked my heart open was, you gave these people an economy. And I'd never heard of that term offered that way before. You know, when we talk about an economy, we're talking about things like careful management, if it's done consciously. We're talking about conscious production and consumption, goods and services, all the little intricacies that make up uh, a population and the way in which that population thrives. And I couldn't get this word economy out of my mind. And so as we continued our travels, part of my partner's aim was to go to his guru's temple. So my partner has a guru who is Neem Karoli Baba. He was the guru of Ram Das. Ram Das was my partner's teacher. And so all of his life, he had wanted to be able to go there. So we tra traveled to the Himalayas. And um, we would go to temple prayers every morning, which is called Arti, where they light the, the lights and the flames, and they put it in front of each of the, the deities of Shiva, and, and they invoke these temple prayers. And my partner had brought a gift of temple prayer books to this uh, to his temple, to his guru's temple, who's, who passed in the 70s or left his physical body in the 70s. And so we were doing our best to read Hindi and English at the same time and to sing our prayers with all the local people as we're being carried through the temple. And this Indian man's finger would come onto the page of the book like this and he would go and he would move it like the bouncing ball. He was trying to help us keep up with all of the temple prayers and he'd keep doing this. And we both kind of cracked up because it was, he was so insistent and we thought, let him help us, let him help us. And so he was doing that and he was taking great pride in the fact that he would look over and we were bastardizing our Hindi, trying to sing and he would move us around. So when all the temple prayers were done, it takes like an hour and a half. When it was all complete, we thanked him. Uh, we were smiling. We just said, thank you so much for your, your finger help. And he motioned, he said, meet me outside. And so all the shoes are out there and we're putting our shoes back on. And he said, would you like to go to other temples in the Himalayas? And we both looked at each other and we went, yeah. And as we were preparing to, he had a car. We had a car, he had a car with gas in it. <laughs> And the roads up the Himalayas are like these little one lane jagged things. And even on his bald tires with things falling over the mountain, we went on this amazing adventure. And, um, and he was telling us, and, and I could feel, I could feel the energy of the Himalayas. I, and I know it sounds so blasé and stereotypical to say that, but it was incredibly palpable to me. I don't know if there's in any other place in the world that I've been in where my skin was 
goosebumply the whole time. And he took me to um, he took me to caves. Now I want you to imagine that there are some saints and sages that people know about. They know the whole thing about this this city, someone who gave up all material possessions and lived in this cave and did all of these wonderful things. For everyone you know, there are tens of thousands of other cities and caves within the mountains around the world that people don't know about. And so he was telling us about one whose name was Sambari Baba, and he died in 1919. And so he took us to one cave that Sambari Baba used to sit in, and it's open to the public, and it's just this little tiny space. And when it was my turn to sit in there, I didn't want to leave. But I was very conscious of the fact that there were other people waiting. And so it was like this deep homecoming. And then he said to us, there is the second cave of Sambari Baba. Sambari Baba, Sambari, the word in Hindi, by the way, means Monday. And during his life, very much like uh, alignment with the story of Jesus and the loaves and the fishes, people would come to him at the mouth of his cave. And he would have food on this plate. And all of the villagers would eat from this singular plate, and the food would never diminish. Just like the loaves and the fidgets, hundreds of people would come. And on that Monday, he would feed and feed and feed people. And so he became known as Sambari Baba, or the Baba of the Monday. And he said, there is the second cave. And he said, but What's fascinating about the second cave is it's been closed for a hundred years. He died in 1919 and they closed it and they just opened it right at the beginning of COVID. And not very many people have been there. And when we went there, there was no pujari. There was no temple guard. There was no management. It was completely empty. And he walked us up and up and up and down into this cavern where there was the second Sambari Baba cave. And we had all the time in the world. So down in the cave I went. And it was electric. And it was the deepest experience of silence that I have ever felt in my life. With the exception of a fly. Somehow, some inexplicable way, a fly had gotten down into the deep, deepest part of this cave. And as I was relishing in the quiet, this fly would go bzzz. And my first instinct, my first reflex was, oh man, this would be so perfect if this fly wasn't here. And then I smiled and I thought, oh my God, this is perfect. This is a perfect example of the stillness, of the no-thingness. The, it, it's inescapable to describe it, but it would be the closest that I could imagine that no-thingness, the dissolving into the one, along with the buzzing, which represents the duality and the noise of our experience, the yin-yang of being human. And here they both were. And there was still a part of me was like, maybe the fly will go away. Maybe I will just be left in this perfect stillness. And the fly got louder. And that's when the surrender to the fly or the surrender to the duality happened. And I realized that what I was being given was the most beautiful representation of the experience of this plane of form. And that is, it is a waste of my energy and your energy to want the flies to go away or to craft even a life that is built upon the eradication of the fly. What we are invoked and invited to do in this sort of cave existence in the plane of form is to recognize the existence of that, to recognize the duality 
and to allow ourselves to not become so trapped in the hungry ghost, which is trying to feed a methodology to make something go away, but rather to surrender totally to that which is the stillness, even in the ultimate noise. Easier said than done. Completely one of the, the biggest masterful invitations that you and I are given. And I was sitting there and I, I thought for a second that maybe my partner left and the, 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 the man had left because it felt like I had been sitting there for an eternity. And they did eventually call my name to come, to come out of the cave. But as I was sitting there, the final thoughts were the words that my partner had said to me, you've established an economy that didn't exist before. And I began to think again about, well, what is an economy? And in the moment exiting the cave, I thought about the, the phrase, a spiritual economy. And that what you are in charge of and what I am in charge of is the careful management of, of our spiritual connection, our economy, if you will, the, the consumption and the production of what it is that we're doing in the world. The way in which we develop a willingness an allowance to be able to hold the yin-yang experience, a way in which we practice looking at the world of effect and all of the horrors and to practice seeing beyond it, not practice by just sitting there and not being involved, but by looking at those things and letting that energize an advocacy that is so pristine that it need not waste its time on trying to eradicate something, but lifting up the truth of what is, of seeing the dignity and the meticulousness of the way in which this world weaves its work, its work together. Ram Das, one of our favorite teachers, said, there is no error in creation. There's no error. But how many times have I caught myself going, wow, that's an error, and that's an error, and that's an error. Boy, that person is an error. You know, and all this con unconscious judgment that is weighted down, and I'm thinking along with that, if that would just go away, if that expression of darkness would just disappear. And the maturity that comes along with a deep respect and devotion to developing a spiritual economy is recognizing that we don't just cover things over. We help get at the root of whatever the systemic issue is, not by force, but by seeing the truth beyond the appearance. So imagine, imagine the spiritual economy of someone like Mother Teresa, who as she's walking through the streets of Calcutta and she's, she's picking up the lepers out of the gutters, she's not seeing them as lepers, she's seeing them as her beloved. She's seeing every single thing that is hard to manage and hard to process as a perfect expression of the divine. It's very hard to absorb that. But what I love about this idea of a personal spiritual economy and the time of year by which we are talking is that we have this weird thing where this time of year, we give ourselves more permission for a reset. Have you noticed that? It's like, ah, the year's ending. And we have some inexplicable self-compassion where it's like, okay, we'll wipe the slate clean and we're going to start over. We're going to have a do-over. And I kind of laugh at that and I go, why don't we do that on March 18th or June 27th or September 3rd? You know, why, why do we wait all year before we're so compassionate that we give ourselves a do-over? 
But hey, if we're going to do it, then think about it this way. I heard someone say that we are the amalgamation or the hybrid of the five people that we spend the most time with. And people sort of panic at that statement, particularly people who have large families. <laughs> and they go, I can't help it. We're all under the same roof. And I'm not necessarily talking about that group dynamic, but I'm talking about the people that you chat with, the people who you hang with, the, the co-workers that you tend to align with. If we're an amalgamation of the five people that we spend the most time with, then I want you to imagine that what we are is porous. We're, we're a sponge and we are slowly absorbing the opinions and the, and the, dare we say, missteps of those people, not because they're wrong or we're wrong, but because that's just the nature of existing in this human form. But if we if we align ourselves in a way where we go, okay, do over. Because I believe how you exit is how you enter something. You know, I used to tell my students, if you, if you exit a situation like this, you enter into the situation, the next situation like this. Just your energy is where you last left it, right? And so as we're exiting a human year, a calendar year, what would happen if we began to look at ourselves as a mobile spiritual economy? And that the responsibility that we have of the, of the ripple effect that we're going to bring to the world, would that begin to shift some of our priorities, some of our relationships? some of our habits and conditions? Because I believe that that's exactly what we are. Can we be in the stillness and at the same time smile at the fly and just understand that's a part of the curriculum? Our soul knew what it was doing. It knew what it was doing because there's no error and creation. It knew what it was doing to come in as you and me. And I believe that with beginner's mind and with that state of allowing, that we do have the ability to take advantage of the ending of a human year, or whatever that means, or whatever it's worth, and to create this fresh intent where we're going to perhaps spend less of our energy trying to make something go away and spend more of our energy invoking the stillness, even in the heart of chaos. And I wonder what would happen with our sense of wellness, our, men, our mental state. I wonder what would happen if our, with our fatigue if we were not so consumed in trying to eradicate something, but to walk into any and all systemic issues with a vision rather than this. And it was quite profound to being in Sambari Baba's cave. I was telling this to um, my friend who has been studying to be a Shigong master for many, many years. His teachers are actually in China. And his final teacher that he saw several years ago said to him, go away and come back when you have finished raising your family. And he said, when you come back, I will take you to these caves where teachers have sat in them for so long, for so many years, meditating going deep into the stillness, cr creating, if you will, a sort of spiritual economy that the smoke from the incense of the cave has left impressions of their face on the ceilings. And I think about all of the countless cities, which in Hindu means those who have 
simply let go of all materialism and have de devoted their life to serving humanity. When I think of the countless thousands of those caves and that energy, I believe that we are included in the work that they did. I believe that we are a part of the ripple effect of their spiritual economy. And I believe that each of us has a, a divinity to our unique brand of creativity. We don't have to travel the world and to go into any exotic place. All that we need do is surrender ourselves to what that wisdom wants from us. And in that surrender, I believe that what happens is that we become profoundly aware of the responsibility, not the burdened responsibility, but the beautiful responsibility that we have to be the person that is willing to shed the light in the world. That's not a calling that is held for just a special few. That is the universal calling. That is why we are here. And so it is. If you could lead our meditation, we'd be delighted. Sure. Close your eyes and take a breath. And as you begin to continue noticing the intake and the sensation as it enters through your nostrils and gently goes out your lips, I want you to consider something. That consideration is playing with two energies. One is the energy of allowing, and the other is the energy of resistance. If there was a goal with this in the breath, it would be to just begin to notice and become aware of where we are on the spectrum of resistance and allowing. And so I'm going to invite you now on the inhale to either speak out loud or say to yourself, I allow. On the inhale, just simply say, I allow. And on the exhale, to say, I release all resistance. So very rhythmically, breathing in, I allow. I release all resistance. Give yourself a few seconds to establish that rhythm, breathing in, invoking that permission of allowing, breathing out, being willing to release consciously or unconsciously, whatever it is that we might be resisting. And do that for just a few moments. And now as you're breathing in, I want you to pick a word that you're going to add to the I allow statement. So it could be I allow clarity, I allow healing, I allow abundance. Whatever word is pressing at you in the immediacy of your human experience right now, I want you to take that word, that feeling, that desire, and add it to the intake, the inhale. I allow clarity. And then exhale, I release all resistance. Find your word. And as we continue to breathe, we pause for a moment to acknowledge the beauty and the simplicity of what it means to release all resistance. There are many depths and many layers to this. There is that which is on the surface, but then there is that willingness to release the resistance that is deeply rooted. 
And it is this deep root exploration that we give ourselves permission now in our gathering to explore, to align with, to nurture, and to understand that in the release of resistance, a meticulous spaciousness is opened up and that spaciousness begins to be filled by that which we are willing to allow. We no longer choose to just allow it with the same stale energy, but we become a more mindful, more aware, more collaborative with exactly what it is that we are welcoming in. That transformation, that invocation is the very essence of our personal evolution. Something as simple as that, I allow, I release all resistance. And with this practice now, we open ourselves to beginner's mind. In beginner's mind, we release any attachment to old ways of thinking. We release any resistance that we might have to something that might just push the envelope a, bit, a little bit in our belief system. Being willing to consider and to listen with fresh ears and an open heart. This is what we call, this is what we allow today individually and collectively. And if you would share with me now by anchoring this in and saying, and so it is. Amen.